reading to you from the third chapter of the Gospel, John, and the 36th verse. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Good evening, my dear listening friends. Again, this evangelist Cecil Moen, as you know, I'm a converted alcoholic, and I gave my heart to Christ over 39 years ago in a pastor's home in Seattle, Washington. One year later, God called me to preach, and I've been enjoying 21 years on KPOF. I have a special announcement tonight for you people who are looking for work. I run into a, a lady the other day, uh, Susan Del Toro, and uh, she works for a company that uh, are looking for people to want to go to work. And so uh, on the second segment of the broadcast, I'm going to give you this information. So if you're looking for a job or you're looking for someone to work for you, please stay tuned and uh, I'll give you the phone numbers, how to get a hold of them. And we just might be able to help so many people who are looking to work. I'll be with for, with for an hour tonight. Just kick off your slippers, sit back and relax, and let's see what the Lord has for us, okay? Friends, would you unite your heart with me in prayer at this time? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the many, many blessings of life. Father, I pray that uh, this announcement that we're to make on the broadcast tonight might help many, many people who are seeking work. And precious Lord, I know that there's jobs for everybody here in this town. It just seems like you got to get the right place at the right time. And so I'm praying, Lord, that you would uh, really bless in this uh, endeavor to help people get work. And I pray that these people who are going through trials and tribulations of their faith might realize that you are concerned about every one of us, irregardless of what our situation might be. You're concerned because you said you would be. You even told us, Lord, that you'd go with us even unto the end of the world. We believe that, Lord. Now, Father, I pray that you'll help me to speak tonight with love, with compassion. And, Lord, I pray that you'll hide me behind the cross, lift up Jesus, honor your holy word, and, Lord, save that sinner that's on the road to hell tonight. And we ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. ago when I was a little boy, uh, there was a uh, reform school not very far from where I lived, and I used to try to find out from my mother what was a reform school. 
Well, she said it's boys that went out and got themselves in trouble, and, and they put them there to reform them. Well, I've thought about that many times. Well, dear friends, let me tell you what. I know a lot of women who have married alcoholics like I used to be, who thought as soon as they get married to me, I'll reform them. Well, reformation isn't worth a plug, plug nickel. People need transformation. The Bible said in Psalms 19.7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And in Psalm 51.12, Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy way, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. You know, when I first started preaching, years and years and years ago, I used to believe that every time I stepped in the pulpit to preach, someone would be converted to Christ. You say, well, what, were you that good a preacher? No, I wasn't then, and I'm still not. No, it's because I knew what a sinner felt like. I knew what it was to be lost in my sin. I knew what it was to be a no-good, stinking drunk. That's why I uh, have uh, good things going for me in prison. Because most of those men in prison, they'll tell you, that they went to prison because well, when they were drunk, they did this particular crime. Or when they were on drugs, they did this particular crime. Well, I know what they feel like. I know how they feel. I know how empty, how terrible it is to be wanting peace, wanting your sins forgiven, but not knowing how to get it done. No, what men need to be is transformed. And that can only be done by a spiritual birth. Jesus told Nicodemus that in the third chapter of the Gospel of John. Folks, listen, I get a lot of repercussion and a lot of feedback from people, even from my own church. Why, oh why, Cecil, do you waste your time going with Bill Adelong and Tex and those fellows down to prison to talk to those prisoners? Well, first of all, I do it not because I have to do it, and as certainly we do not get paid for it. In fact, it takes money out of our pocket to do it. But Jesus said, I was in prison, and ye visited me not. I was hungry, and you fed me not. And on and on. They said, well, how come that? How's that come about? Jesus said, inasmuch as you've done this, the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. Well, we don't go in there with a chip on our shoulder. We don't go in prison uh, looking down on those men, even though the, the sins that they have committed, many of them are very heinous. Yes, they are. Child molesters and on and on and on. But when we go in prison, we go there because we have a message, a message of God's redeeming grace. Otherwise, we're telling them there is a light at the end of the tunnel which is Christ the Lord. Some of you tonight listening to this broadcast have never found Christ as your Savior. You went to church, and you have been baptized, and you've taken the Lord's Supper, and on and on and on and on. But you have never personally confessed to the Lord that you were a sinner and invited Him to come into your heart. See, a lot in Acts 3.19 it says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Repent. That means you have said, I am going to turn my back on the old way of life. And then you ask Jesus to come into your heart and to be your Savior. And if you're sincere about it, <clears throat> I'll assure you, on the authority of God's holy word, he'll do it. You know, after I was saved, my drinking friends 
would come to the house. Maybe lots of time I wouldn't be there. And they'd say to my wife, where's Cecil? Well, he's out working. Well, yeah, 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 he's out working. He's down there in a bar somewhere. No, he's not in a bar because he's a changed man. Oh, yeah, he's a changed man. <clears throat> the scripture says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become as new. And that's exactly what happened to me the morning I accepted Christ. He took that old ugly heart out. He washed those old <clears throat> black sins away. And he gave me a new spirit. And he wrote my name in the Lamb Book of Life. And he set my feet on a solid rock and gave me peace. For the first time in my life, some people tonight or tomorrow or the following week will be going <clears throat> to mental hospitals because you can't find peace and you've given up. Why do you think people go out and commit suicide? Because they give up. They don't think there's any hope. That's why we named the film that I produced Against All Hope. Because according to anyone who knew me or knew my lifestyle would say there is no hope for Cecil Moe. He's a no good drunk. Oh, I've heard that from my family. I've heard that from my friends. But God fooled him. He let him know that he can change and transform a heart. And he did it for me. Many of you listening tonight have been transformed by the blood of Jesus. Your sins have been washed away. And then again, some of you have started out with a bang. Boy, you were doing great things for the Lord, and something happened in the church, or someone hurt you, and you quit. You said, I'm not, if I, I can't take this. Well, I'm urging you tonight to come back to Jesus and tell him that you're sorry. The Bible said if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just what? To forgive our sins. Now that's talking to the Christian. That's not talking to the lost man. He said, if you've, con if you've sinned and you're a Christian, you come back to Jesus and you tell him that you've done, and then you invite him into your heart. Repent of it, and he'll restore to you the joy of your salvation. Now, friends, let me tell you a story. Many of you have heard this story, but some of you haven't. Joe Hoskins was a Indian born and raised in the Lummi Island uh, Indian Reservation just out of uh, Bellingham, Washington. Joe's family were all alcoholics. Joe had never seen love in his life. And by the time he was 15 years old, he had done four years in reform school. Joe was tough. He was mean. And he got in an accident in the, in the prison or the reform school, and he lost his right arm right above, the, right above the elbow. After he got out of there, he started drinking again and getting in trouble. Now he gets 15 years in the prison in Walla Walla, Washington. You say, well, what about it? Well, he never learned anything in reform school. He never learned anything in the, in, in the, in the penitentiary. But he got out. I got a job as a truck driver, a common, ordinary old truck driver, in a rescue mission in Bellingham, Washington. They told me, well, we're going to give you a, a, a helper. And out came Joe Hoskins. You could smell wine all over him. He's so ugly, he looked like someone took a ball bat and flattened his head and his face. And he had scars all over his face and his body where he'd been beaten. There wasn't a there wasn't a, a, a police officer in the city of Bellingham, Washington, up until that time that Joe Hoskins hadn't whipped. He could he was tough. He could he could fight. He whipped everybody there was in the rescue mission, but me and the director. And boy, I don't know why he didn't whip us. But I made up my mind that I was going to try to win Joe Hoskins to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as he unfolded his life and how unhappy, and he never had a dad that said, Joe, I love you. He never had a mom that said, Joe, I love you. And so he didn't know anything about love. 
He thought the way he was being treated was the way the world was. Well, I used to invite Joe Hoskins to come to church with me. And he said, I am not going to your church. I belong to a different religion, and I don't want you to even ask me. Well, I kept praying. My family kept praying for Joe Hoskins. One time I said, Joe, would you, be glad, would you come to my house for Sunday dinner and meet my wife and kids? He said, I told you I wouldn't go to church. I said, I'm not asking you to go to church, Joe. I'm asking you to come have dinner with us. All right, he said, I'll do it. So Joe gussied up, put on his best clothes, and I went on and got him into mission and brought him over to house. We sat there and we visited. And my little girl at that time used to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. And she'd bounce on the davenport. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible, to why, it'd drive you insane. But anyway, the next morning when I got to the rescue mission, there Joe Hoskin was with a cup of coffee for me and one for him. And we sat down on a porch of the old rescue mission, and he, he said, You know, Cecil, I have never been in a Christian home until yesterday. I felt love in that home. I felt something I'd never, ever felt before. And that little girl singing, Jesus loves me, said she knows more about Jesus than I do. And she's just a little girl. Well, Joe, I said, that's the way it is. Well, <clears throat> you'd think that would be the turning point in Joe's life, but it wasn't. It, he was a turning boy, but he turned worse. One night he went out and he got terribly drunk. The next morning when we got ready to go out and pick up a load uh, of some furniture, Oh, he had a hangover, and I know what that was, because I've had millions of them. And he said to me, you say the wrong word, and I'm going to knock your head off. Why, Joe, I'm not going to say anything. I didn't go out and get drunk, but I know what you feel like. And not a very good feeling, is it? He said, no, it's not. We never said another word. We went up to this house, pulled up in the yard, and... <clears throat> I said, Joe, I said, uh, as mad as you are, maybe you ought to go out and pick up that big chair. And friends, he was as strong as an ox. He said, I can handle it. He got out and he went over and he picked that chair up over his head and he threw it in the truck. Got back and he says, now say another word. I never said another word. I just kept praying in my breath, oh God, help this poor Indian boy. My heart goes out to him. I feel so sorry for him. And I feel sorry for those men in prison. Oh, some of the stories I hear from those guys. After the service is over around there, they'll stay and they'll want to talk to Bill and I. There's just not enough time to share with those men all the things we'd like to share with them. Well, <clears throat> one day a friend of mine uh, was a pilot, airplane pilot, and he called me at the mission. He said, hey, Cecil, he said, I'm going to take some uh, film over to uh, the uh, Vashon Island. He said, would you like to go along with me? And I said, why, sure. It's a beautiful day. And I, I said, wait a minute. I said, Joe, have you ever been up in an airplane? No, no, I've never been up in an airplane. I said, well, how'd you like to go flying? He said, well, yeah, I'd like to. So Joe got in the back seat, and I got in the front seat with Ted, and we take off. It was terrible turbulent. And he had a Cessna 172. It was very turbulent. And that little plane was bouncing like a cork. And Ted said, look at uh, Joe, I'm going to fly over your reservation and show you where you used to live. So we circled over there and around the uh, Indian reservation. Then we started to cross the ocean uh, to uh, the island. And all of a sudden, I looked in the back seat, and Joe was a very brown Indian. Boy, he was like leather. He was as white as snow, literally as white as snow. And he had his little stub, <laughs> had his little stub arm against the window and his good hand against it. And I said, Joe, what's the matter, buddy? He said, I'm scared. Scared of what? 
Some are scared we're going to crash. Well, I said, it doesn't bother me if we crash. It's absent from the body, present with the Lord. And he said, that's what I'm talking about. But I said, Joe, that's not God's fault. It's your fault. You're the one that has never repented of his sin and invited Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. And that's all I said. We flew on over and we came back. About two weeks later, I was associate pastor of a church there in Bellingham, as well as being a truck driver. And I, my pastor was going out of town. He said, Cecil, he said, I want you to run this missionary film and be sure and give an invitation to the film because it's a soul-winning film. I said, okay. So I said, hey, Joe, would you? I said, this isn't going to be a real church service. We're just going to have a film. Would you like to come? He said, well, okay. Well, I got nothing else to do. So he came, and who would walk in but Ted, my pilot, and his wife. So the three of them sat together. After the film was over, uh, the organist came to play the invitational hymn. We sang about two verses, and all of a sudden, Joe stood back there with his little stub arm up in the air. Just stood there. I said, you know, maybe there's somebody here tonight who would like to give their heart to Christ, but they're a little afraid. Why don't you take that person by the hand standing beside you? I know they'd come down the aisle, and Joe reached over and grabbed Ted's hand, and down the aisle they went, and Joe came up to me, and he threw that old stub arm around my neck, and he said, well, if you can't beat them, I guess you got to join them. And that night, Joe Hoskin invited Christ into his heart. You say, well, what else happened? Well, I want you to know, beloved, everybody in that city seemed to know about Joe Hoskins' conversion. The police department certainly knew about it. And they'd come to me and they'd say, Cecil, what has happened to Joe Hoskins, that mean, ugly, lummy out an Indian? I said, Jesus. Jesus came into his heart and changed him and saved him and gave him a new heart. Well, many, many times, Joe and I would be invited to churches, and Joe and I would share our testimonies. Well, things were going along for about a year and a half, just absolutely beautiful. And then one afternoon, I received a phone call from Seattle, Washington. This guy said, are you Reverend Cecil Moe? I said, I'm Cecil Moe. He said, I have a man here, and he's drunk. And uh, he's crying. And he said, the only friend he had in the world on this earth was you. Is that right? I said, well, I'm sure he's friend. I said, I'll be down there in an hour and a half. And I called another alcoholic friend of mine that I'd led to Christ several years before. And we got in our car and we drove down to the, the roughest bar I've ever been in life in Seattle, Washington. We walked in there and those people gave us a look. And we walked there to back, and there Ted, I mean, there uh, Joe was with his head laying on the table, crying. And I reached down, and I tapped him on his shoulder, and I said, Joe. He looked up, and he jumped up, and he threw his, <laughs> threw his arms around my neck, and he said, oh, I screwed up. I really messed up, sis. I said, I know it, Joe, but I said, come on, I'm going to take you home. And all the way home, he, he told me, and this other guy, how sorry he was. And I said, well, Joe, could you tell me why you did it? Did you know that Joe Hoskins had one time been married and had a boy, and his wife was a prostitute, and he was going down and trying to find and tell her about Jesus, but when he got with the evil influence down there, he got drunk instead. Well, as last drunk Joe went on, and he was... He got back the way he used to be and telling people about Christ. And and then one night, uh, Joe, uh, or one afternoon, Joe went uh, up to an apartment and there's an outside stairs, and he walked up these stairs and he stumbled and his little stub arm couldn't catch the railing and Joe fell and was killed. Well, I tell you, dear friends, I'll never forget that funeral as long as I live. I'll never forget that as long as I live. Joe, they put him in a little old cheap K-1 
casket. Of course, that don't make a difference when you when you're dying anyway. But the uh, director of the mission got up and said, "Joe had many heartaches in life, but one day Joe found the answer when he found Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior." Well, someday old Joe and I will get to see each other again on the other side of glory. And I want to walk up and hug that old Indian boy's neck and tell him, Joe, I'm so glad, I'm so glad that God sent me to that rescue mission so I could meet you. Friends, I could tell you many, many stories about men and women I've introduced to Christ when I was myself the director of rescue missions. And I've seen lives changed, and I've seen homes brought back together because of one person, Jesus. No, the church didn't change him. No, baptism didn't say it, change him. No, the Lord's Supper didn't change him. The Lord Jesus Christ. Now, tonight, you say, well, Cecil, whoa, wait a minute. Now, I never was an alcoholic. But, you know, I don't have that peace that you're talking about. I'm, well, how come I have to be saved? Because the Bible said you do. You and I were born with the old Adamic nature, the nature of our great-grandparents. They were cast forth out of the garden because they disobeyed God and believed Satan. But you and I are born with that same nature. Now, the only way that nature, I mean, that uh, the sins can be eradicated is by the blood of, of Jesus. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. You have to, the shed blood of Christ has to wash away your sins. Now, let me ask this. Are you ready for that tonight? Would you like that to happen in your life? Would you like to have your sins forgiven? Friends, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that after you're saved, God will give you a Cadillac car. God will give you a $150,000 a year job. It don't work that way. It might be for somebody, but it didn't me. But I'll tell you this. You'll find the sweetest peace this side of heaven. God is going to give you that peace. I know the night I was saved, friends, I used to have to go to bed with a six-pack of beer beside my bed because I couldn't sleep. I was so troubled. And that rotten booze would put me to sleep. Give me false security or whatever you want to call it. But the first night after I accepted Christ, I didn't have to have booze no more. All I had in that night was Jesus, and what a night's rest. My wife watched me like a hawk, fully expecting me to go back to drinking. But I never did do it because of Jesus. I can't take credit for it, friends. It's because of Jesus. Now, you may never drank a bottle of beer. You may never smoked a cigarette. You never, may never cussed a word in your life. But you're still lost if you haven't accepted Jesus. That's the way the Bible reads. Now, would you like to know him in a personal way? If you say, Cecil, oh, I really would, I really would. Here's what you need to do. Bow your head with me right now. Pray this simple, simple prayer. Dear Lord, I'm repenting of my sins. I'm turning my back on the old way of life. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior tonight. Oh, thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that with a sincere heart, I will assure you, you are a new person. Absolutely a new person. And things will be different in your house. You'll be able to witness. Find you a good, a good study Bible and get into a good New Testament Christ-honoring church. And be sure it's a Christ-honoring church, not just a social club. There's a lot of social clubs around town too, but there's churches where you can hear the gospel and you can learn God has a purpose for your life. He's got a place for your life. Now look at who'd have thought an old drunk. I've been on television all over the country. I've traveled halfway around the world. I've written a book, and there's been a book written about my life. I've done oodles of TV talk shows, not because I'm special, but because I have somebody that did something in my life, and I want to share him. That's why it happened. It could happen to you. Yes, it could. My phone number is 840-2992. Now, that's not long distance. I live here in Parker. 840-2992. If you'd like to talk to me, or you don't quite understand what I'm talking about, please call. I won't use your name on the air. I won't embarrass you. I won't call your pastor. I won't sit down and write and ask you for money. I don't do that. I'm concerned. Not where you go to church, 
go where you spend eternity. 840-2992.